Uh, I first of all want to say thank you to Rob and uh, Barbara for inviting me and including me in the program. Thanks. I guess I want to see if this works, first of all. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a presentation, a really quick presentation on, on pine bark beetles, which is a big topic. So I'm going to cover it in a very general way. Uh, I'm going to start out talking about the diversity of the pine trees and the bark beetles in California, um, mostly by presenting a series of factoids and uh, information about numbers of species that we have in the state. Uh, and then I want to talk to you about the interaction of the beetle with the tree and focus on its uh, damage and the damage that the beetles cause, which a lot of people are quite interested in. And then if time allows at the end, I have some research data focused mostly on chemical ecology and pheromones and the like to, uh, to share with you. So going through these quickly, uh, uh, botanists have determined that California has somewhere around 90 native forest and woodland tree species, of which 21 are unique to the state. So uh, it goes along with what we've been hearing today about proportions and endemism. Um, we've got about 60 species of conifers in general in the state and 19 native pines uh, and a substantial number of additive pines, pines from the Mediterranean that have been planted all over the state. And I've been increasingly interested in, in these types of tree species, uh, things like Aleppo pine, uh, Italian stone pine, Canary Island pine, and down here, Turkish red pine. Uh, these trees are planted widely throughout the Central Valley, uh, the urban areas, the, particularly the LA Basin, uh, San Diego County, and the Bay Area. Um, by and large, they've sort of evaded uh, forest insect, but the bark beetles seem to be catching up to them now. And they provide interesting way stations or islands uh, of additive forest throughout the state. So we have a lot of these types of pines in terms of uh, number throughout California. <clears throat> so turning now to the diversity of bark beetles, uh, the characterization of bark beetles in California really began in the late 1800s when a series of USDA entomologists uh, uh, went all throughout the West, led by this fellow, A.D. Hopkins, uh, who was uh, sort of the father of forest entomology in, in the United States. Hopkins and his uh, band of married men were known as the entomological rangers. They used to ride around on horses and take trains and stuff. In those days, there were no cars. Uh, and so they quickly figured out what the major economically important bark beetles were in the West and in, in California. And after that period of sort of federal uh, involvement, we had a series of academic taxono taxonomists from universities, particularly uh, these two gentlemen, Stephen Wood and Donald Bright, who worked in the latter part of the 20th century to characterize uh, bark beetles really throughout the world. But Bright's thesis was done here at UC Berkeley, and it was published in, in 1973 by UC Press. And in that thesis, uh, Don uh, figured out we had somewhere around 200 different species of bark beetles in California, representing about 50 genera. And of those 200, about 90 were on, on pine trees, actually. Most of them were, were small bark beetles that we'll talk about in a second. Um, that number of 200 uh, is about a third of what we have in the United States and Canada. So California has a, has a high uh, diversity of species of, of bark and ambrosia beetles. I want to mention invasive species in, in addition to the things like the advent of pines I was talking about. We have 22 species of, of invasive bark and ambrosia beetles in California that we recently uh, characterized and, and published something on. And three of those uh, listed in blue here uh, are on pine trees. This is a Mediterranean species, uh, attacks the base of pines. Uh, this is also a Mediterranean species, it's like a hips type beetle. And then that last one is kind of interesting. It's an invader from the eastern U.S. It's also a pine infesting uh, bark beetle. <clears throat> so altogether, between the native species and the invasives, you've got somewhere in the 225-ish uh, range uh, bark beetles. So I want to talk a little bit now about the interactions of these organisms, the pines and, and the beetles. Uh, one thing that people really might not appreciate is that the bark and ambrosia beetles spatially partition these pine trees. It's not just one bark beetle that's out there. There's a whole complex. And they feed on the phloem in, uh, in the case of the bark beetles, and they feed in the wood, in the case of the ambrosia beetles, uh, tissues all throughout the tree, from the roots down here, the main stem, up into the branches, and even the twigs, and then the cones, too. So 
I saw a fly that had a name that was very similar to this bark beetle. This is called Conopterus, or the destroyer of cones. And there was a conop, cone of something that was one of the flies in the first talk. It's kind of interesting. Um, but a lot of that diversity, when I mentioned 90 species of, of bark beetles and pines, are, are up here in these Pityopterus. These are tiny twig infesting beetles. And Don Bright, that happened to be his specialty, so he discovered just about every one that's here in the state. Uh, I want to emphasize that these beetles are some of our most pernicious pests because they attack the main stem of the tree and they're, they're damaging the nutritious phloem, uh, which is an uh, organ for, for moving uh, nutrients as well as storing nutri nutrients. But also the ambrosia beetles are tunneling into the xylem and creating channels and tunnels where they culture fungi that they feed on. So they're really going after the integral part of and vital part of the tree. And of course, that causes the mortality that, that many of us are, are aware of from going to the Sierra Nevada. In addition to partitioning this tree spatially, there's also some temporal partitioning that goes on. The bark beetles are really, I use this analogy a lot, maybe too much, but they're like enzymes. They sort of catalyze the process of, of furthering the decline of already senescent trees. And they make it possible for later stage wood borers uh, like these larger ones here, round-headed borers and flat-headed borers, wood wasps, to take uh, advantage of the wood tissue of these trees. And then even later stage organisms like carpenter ants and termites and powder post beetles can take advantage of the biodeteriorating tree that, that they wouldn't have gotten to if the bark beetles hadn't gotten there first. So in a way, they're like the lions and tigers of the Serengeti. They take down the carcass and then you get everything else, the jackals and the vultures and stuff like that. When we think about the impacts of these beetles, uh, historically it was always in terms of wood production. And this is a very old, uh, relatively historic uh, bar chart showing the amount of saw timber, pine saw timber, that was lost in California annually since the 20s. And these bars here go up to about a, a billion and a half board feet. Uh, so bark beetles were taking out large quantities of our trees. I don't think we cut this much timber anymore in California. Uh, but historically, bark beetles have had a major impact economically in our state, and uh, this is how we quantified it, looking at the amount of uh, wood volume that was taken out. More recently, we're, we're basically counting trees using aerial survey methods, and this was a news release from this past fall, suggesting that over the last six, seven years, we've lost 100 million uh, trees in the California forests, as detected by our aerial survey people. And actually, within 2016, we've lost uh, 60 million trees, trees, which is a large number. And most of those have been pines, it appears. We've tried to break the data down as best we can, and we've got about seven times more uh, pines than we do of the non-pines that, that were in that 62 million. And then if you look at that even more finely, a lot of those are ponderosa pines. There's some Jeffrey pines. Uh, the sugar pines seem quite small here, but I'm guessing there's a lot of them hidden in this mixed conifer bar here. <laughs> so these are our primary uh, tree species that are, are getting uh, killed by the bark beetles. <clears throat> and this is a photo from this past spring uh, in the Fresno Bee talking about the tree mortality. Most of it was in the southern Sierra Nevada, and they mentioned in here uh, that it was ponderosa and sugar pines that, that uh, we were seeing the mortality in. So another thing to consider, um, and uh, Sarah earlier talked about this when she was describing her studies on Santa Cruz Island, is the interaction of drought directly with, with the beetles, or indirectly with the beetles. And this is a bar chart uh, from the San Bernardino uh, area, uh, showing annual precipitation. Each bar here is an amount of precipitation uh, measured each year from, what is that, the late 1800s or so, all the way up into the early 2000s. And there are three lines here. This is the average uh, annual precipitation. This is 80% of the average. And this is 60% of the average. And these two lines uh, represent uh, levels of, of drought, drought stress, or physiological drought stress. Uh, the 80% being moderate, uh, and the 60% being extreme. And that's as defined by ecophysiologists who study trees and know more than I do about that. But each of these arrows here is lined up with a, uh, a circumstance or period when the bars do not reach the 60% level. In other words, the trees are inferred to have, have a lot of drought stress at that time. 
And so this is what we would expect to see bark beetle outbreaks. And then these gray arrows here are actual outbreaks that were noted in San Bernardino National Forest. This type of uh, interaction is also quite evident with the Jeffrey Pine Beetle, which is in the eastern Sierra Nevada on Jeffrey Pine. And here too, this, in this case, we're looking at uh, the Palmer Drought Index, showing dry periods, wet periods, dry periods, wet periods, and the number of uh, trees that are killed by this beetle are lining up with the end of these dry periods in the cycle. So I don't think we really understand the mechanism, but it's clear that there's a, a linkage here. And you know, with climate change, we're seeing greater and greater uh, uh, variation and, and intensity to these, these outbreaks. Let me give you four quick examples of how bark beetles, pine bark beetles, have been used to uh, further our understanding of basic science. Uh, first of all, in terms of long-term biological work, or bi what we used to call bionomics, uh, the western pine beetle, one of our major pine bark beetles, was studied for over 50 years uh, by Forest Service scientists, and they published this monograph way back in 1960. In addition, this particular beetle has also been the, the model for population dynamics and understanding of, of how bark beetles function with, with other organisms in nature and what abiotic and biotic factors regulate their populations. And that was a major project done at UC Berkeley. Uh, pine bark has also been the source of information for understanding integrated pest management, another project out of Berkeley. And then lastly, um, Pine bark beetles have been the source of some of the pioneering work in the world on insect plant interactions as well as chemical ecology. My major professor, David Wood, uh, was one of the ones who did this work in the 70s and 80s at, at Cal. So I want to spend the last minutes that I have talking about chemical ecology. That happens to be my uh, uh, area of specialty. And I want to start by showing you this, this flow chart of sorts. It has three trophic levels. It's got the plant, the herbivore, and the carnivore or predator here. And these trophic levels then are linked together by behavioral chemicals, or what we call semiochemicals. Chiromones indicate interspecific uh, linkages or responses. Pheromones, alimones, and cinnamones are here at the one trophic level. These are within a species, and these are also interspecific here. And these things are defined according to who benefits. In chiromones, it's the recipient who senses that particular odor and uses it to their advantage is, is the beneficiary. With alimones, the recipient is actually dissuaded from colonizing, co-colonizing with this herbivore. So this one here wins out. And then cinnamones, as the name might suggest, everybody wins. So there's enough space in the niche uh, for both herbivores to, to make out well. Before I talk about the specifics of chemical ecology, I want to mention that the two main beetles that have been studied in pines in California are, are Ips, uh, Ips species and Dendrochinus species, these two genera. And with Ips, the male beetle is the first one to colonize. With Dendrochinus, it's the female. The male produces the pheromone in this genus, and here females and males generally produce the, pheromone, the aggregation pheromone. This one has what's called a polygynous mating system, where one male has a harem of sorts under the bark, anywhere from two to five females, whereas these are monogenous here, the dendrochinus. So I'll give you two examples from each of these. Um, I may run over that 15 minutes a little bit, but I'll do my best to leave uh, some time for questions. The very first pheromone isolated from any beetle in the world was isolated here in California from Ips paraconfusus. And to, to find that pheromone, uh, Professor Wood and another colleague named Silverstein took the boring dust from the beetle, extracted it in benzene and other things, fractionated it, and then tested the fractions in a behavioral acid where they walked the beetles on a board upwind to the odors created from this, this extract. And using that technique, they found these types of compounds. These are monotropine alcohols, uh, and they named them after the genus of the beetle, Ipsilon and Ipsdiol. They tested these in the field, and they found that the individual components uh, were not very attractive. This is the flight response of the beetles uh, on this axis, and these are the different treatments. No response to the individual ipsinol, ipsdienol, or, or the cisperminol. Whereas here, when you combine two of them, uh, also no response. But when you put all three together, there was a synergism. So this was not only the first pheromone for a beetle, it was the first example of a multi-component uh, pheromone where the components were synergistic. This has kind of opened the door to the isolation and identification 
a whole bunch of pheromones that have been used uh, in management and in, in research uh, since then. And then the last example I want to tell you about is the uh, red turpentine beetle. And this is uh, about as charismatic of a megafauna as you get with a bark beetle. It's a, <laughs> it's a little red beetle about the size of a pinto bee, but it's actually the biggest bark beetle in North America. Uh, this insect is interesting because it's, it's been introduced into China. So that's what we call a reverse invasive. And we talked about all this stuff coming from overseas. This is one where we got them back. And it's killing uh, pines all throughout China. There's some other facts in here, but I want to point out that there really was no understanding of, of its pheromone before we started working on this. Many of you have probably seen these pitch tubes. There's a lot of polio resin and host odors that come out of these attacks from the beetle. Widely distributed in California, often associated with burned trees, as you can see here. It has uh, the typical dendroctus biology. It's monogenous. The female colonizes first. Low parental care, the female just dumps a bunch of eggs into this cave-like gallery here, and it has one generation in a year. So, how do the females find the pines, and how do the males find the females? And I just want to mention, the reason nobody has really worked too much on this beetle is it's a pain in the rear. Because it attacks the base of really large pines, you have to try to cut down the whole tree just to get a couple of sections from the bottom to rear out the insect. And it also flies as soon as the snow melts, or as the snow is melting, for only a couple of weeks is the major flight. If you want to do any work, you've got to be there at that time. So a contemporary of mine, Ken Hobson at UC Berkeley, found a series of monoterpenes that were host components, or chiromones, that were attractive to the males and females. And his three component attractive was, excuse me, um, beta-pinene, carine, and alpha-pinene. And then that was formulated formulated commercially to use as an attractive. So that's the chiromone side, and that works fairly well. But the question is, do they have a pheromone? And there was some suggestion that there was a hydro hydroxylated monoterpene called transverbanol uh, that was produced in the females who've never seen any activity, behavioral activity from that. But we started, uh, we actually got lucky and found it. The mother of all green waste piles down in Salinas on one of the golf courses and these great big Monterey pine sections have red turpentine beetle, had red turpentine beetle in them. We were able to bring those to Davis and work with the insect in the lab. And this is a, some vessels where we put the beetles in and trap the odors from above them. It's much like someone this morning was talking about with uh, spice, the spice plant looking for, for odors. Uh, then we analyzed that by GCMS and we found this chemical, frontalin, which is sort of a typical bark beetle pheromone component. And frontalin can be induced in the female turpentine beetles using a hormone that normally regulates pheromone biosynthesis. So we tested this in the field by using uh, different combinations of these odors and funnel traps. And the chiromone bottle is the monoterpene attractant that attracts both sexes. There was an unmated trap in the experiments and then a, a graded series of frontalin added to the monoterpenes to look for the effect of the pheromone. So the punchline is, this is the male flight response, the female flight response, and this is the blank or unbaited trap. This is the host, host attractor. And then you can see as you add the frontality, you get a significant increase in response. So what we have is a chemical produced by the female attracts the male. So it's in essence a sex pheromone for this beetle. And this is kind of where we've left it. There's probably a male produced component that we don't know about. And I think we've got more work to do uh, in this system. So I'll, I'll end there. I'm sure.